Hey, buddy. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Here uh, we are again. Another Sunday. So another we decided Sunday. we're going to we're going to cover rule seven again and uh, just make it a little little more straight through because we, we got every answer that we had last week answered uh, inside of it. So we don't need to question anything as we go. Right. I don't need to question anything as we go. Right. So, um, so anybody who watched last week's, we're, we're doing it again. Um, but that never hurts when it comes to this material. It, it is really only a benefit to hear it multiple times and many times, because even the way that we read it last week, I, I, I anticipate that it's going to sound even differently to us again. Probably this, will. Yeah. And it's... And, and, it's all a part of the, uh, I mean, it, 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 it happened the way it did for a reason, and it's all a part of the learning process through this, so. It's all about the invocation, or, you know, right. invocation, invocation, and, uh, and that science, which DK says is going to be, you know, the science, you know, of the, of the Aquarian age, pretty much, and, and the new, you know, new religion, new world religion invocation evocation so yeah that it's going to look differently and we're going to read it differently and i guarantee we're going to learn more than uh than we did so yeah that's awesome i'm excited and it's a short rule but it but it i think we agreed that it it's very deep yeah and it's the first rule in the book uh that discusses the astral plane right which is huge. The previous six rules were all about the mental. And now we're starting to dip into the astral. Right. So we're, and, and as he's going to start our way talking down. about, we're, you know, as this is happening, we're, we're, you know, DK's perspective is coming from above, looking below. And we're, so we started mental, we're moving into the astral. And then at, towards the end, we get into the physical, right? Right. He goes through all that, so there's no reason to dig in there. Right. Okay. You want Should me to go, go ahead first? And get started. First? Yeah. Why don't Why don't you get us started this week? Okay. Since I did it last week. All right. Rule seven: A treatise on white magic. The dual forces on the plane whereon the vital power must be sought are seen. The two paths face the solar angel. The poles vibrate. A choice confronts the one who meditates. The battleground of the astral plane, the two paths. Hey, real quick, don't mean to break in, but just for those seeing us for the first time, it's page 103 on the PDF. Um, page 215, if you're following along in the, the blue book, which, there we go. All right, all right sorry, so, Donnie. No, that's all right. We need, it, we need to put that out. The battleground of the astral plane. We must start our study in consideration of the seventh rule for magic. We have completed the first six rules, which deal specifically with work on the mental plane and hence have a practical value only for those who are beginning to utilize the power of the mind in the magical work of creation. It is interesting to note in this connection that as humanity enters into its heritage of mind, there appears simultaneously a growing tendency towards magical work. Schools of affirmation are cropping up on all sides, whose announced intent is to create those natural conditions wherein a man may have what he deems to be admirable and advisable. Books on the subject of the creative mind are flooding the markets and discussions on the force back of the creative arts are deemed of vital interest. Psychologists are giving the entire matter much consideration, and though at present the ideal is viewed almost entirely in terms of the physical plane, yet the sum total indicates a vibratory activity in the world of soul, as it expresses itself through humanity and issues forth from the mental realm. The pioneers of the race, and the foremost thinkers and creative workers of humanity are the sensitives who respond most readily to the mental impulses. 
They are in the minority as yet, and most people respond to the forces and vibrations emanating from the plane of the emotions and of desire. More and more, however, are awakening, and the significance of the six rules, first six first rules of magic will become increasingly apparent. These 15 rules are divided into six rules on the mental plane, five rules on the desire or astral plane, four rules on the physical plane. The main thought to be held clearly in the mind is that they confine themselves to the use of energy in the three worlds. And that this energy is either consciously manipulated by the governing soul or is swept into activity by the force inherent in the matter of the three worlds independently of the soul. When this is the case, the man is a victim of his own form energies and the matter aspect of all manifestation. When this is the case, the man is a victim of his own form energies and the matter aspect of all manifestation. In the other case, he is the intelligent ruler, controller of his own destinies, and swings the lower energies into forms and activities through the power of his mind impulses and the focused attention of his soul. In the six rules already considered, one or two thoughts must clearly emerge and might be summed up in the following terms. Rule one is recollection resulting in concentration. Rule two, response resulting in an interaction between higher and lower. Rule three, radiation resulting in a sounding forth. Rule four, respiration resulting in creative work. Rule five, reunion resulting in the at one Rule six, reorientation resulting in a clear vision of the plan. You have anything so far, Tom? No, sir. Read okay. Students would do well to consider these relationships and to work out the underlying synthesis. In the words of this rule, the astral plane with its function and problem is ably synthesized. Note the term used in the description given in a few short phrases. One, the astral plane of dual forces, or I'm sorry, the plane of dual forces. Two, the plane of the two paths. Three, the plane whereon the vital power is sought. Four, the plane of the vibrating poles. And five, the plane whereon a choice is made. And, you know, there's just really nothing to talk about there because he's just going to keep going with the, uh, the explanations, right? right? But that does, um, th those five simple sentences there are a very simple way, I want to say, to see what we're looking at in terms of the astral plane, mm -hmm. what is there? And when you can understand those words, you can see this in your daily life and, and it's, it's got real, it, it applies. Mm -hmm. It's got practical use for us if we can grasp that stuff. One of the most Vital things every aspirant has to do is to learn to understand the astral plane, to comprehend its nature and to learn both to stand free from it and then to work on it. In this instruction, I seek to give some clear teaching on this plane for the moment a man can see on the astral plane and can achieve equilibrium and hold steady in the midst of its vibrating forces, that moment he is ready for initiation. First, let us gather together some of the terms which are used to describe this sphere of divine being wherewith a man has first to identify himself, penetrate to the center, pierce through its veiled illusion, and eventually stand poised, untouched, detached, uninfluenced, and free. The term astral, so often used in re 
in reality, a misnomer, HPB was basically right. Let me, let me restate that. The term astral, so often used in reality, a misnomer, HPB was basically right when she used the term in connection with the etheric or vital planes of the physical plane. When contact is made with the etheric world, the first impression given is always of a starry light, of brilliance, of scintillation. Gradually, however, the word became identified with comma or desire, and so was used for the plane of emotional reaction. Oh, that, that's a great explanation. Uh, really? It is interesting to note, it is interesting to note this for it is in itself an instance of the effect of the astral plane upon the human brain, which in its uninformed condition reverse the reality and sees things in an upside down state. Wow, that is very deep. The appearance of the astral plane when first definitely seen by the opened eye of the aspirant is one of dense fog, confusion, confusion, changing forms, interpenetrating and intermingling colors, and of, of such a kaleidoscopic experience, appearance, sorry, appearance, that the hopelessness of the enterprise seems overwhelming. It is not light or starry or clear. It is apparently impenetrable disorder for it is the meeting ground of forces. Because the forces in the aspirant's own body are equally in disorder, he blends in with the surrounding chaos to such an extent that it is at first almost impossible for the onlooking soul to dissociate its own astral mechanism from the astral mechanisms of humanity as a whole and from the astral mechanism of the world. One of the first things then that the aspirant has to learn is to dissociate his own aura in the emotional sense from that of his surroundings and much time is expended in learning to do this. It is for this reason that one of the first qualifications of discipleship is discrimination for it is through the use of the mind as the analyzer or sep and separator that the astral body is brought under control. Secondly, the astral plane is the plane of illusion, of glamour, and of a distorted presentation of reality. The reason for this is that every individual in the world is busy working in astral matter, and the potency of human desire and of world desire produces that constant outpicturing and form building, which leads to the most concrete effects of astral matter. Individual desire, national desire, racial desire, the desire of humanity as a whole, plus the instinctual desire of all subhuman lives causes a constant changing and shifting of the substance of the plan. There is a building of temporary forms. There's a building of the temporary forms, some of rare beauty, some of no beauty, and a vitalizing by the astral energy of its creator. And to these forms, that persistent and steadily growing scenario we call the Akashic records, which concern the emotional history of the past, add the activities of the discarnate lives, which are passing through the astral plane, either out of or towards incarnation, and the potent desire, purified and intelligent, of all superhuman lives, including those of the occult planetary hierarchy, and the sum total of forces present is stupendous. Yeah, add them all up and the sum total of forces is stupendous. All play upon, around, and through every human being and according to the caliber of his physical body and the condition of his centers will be his response. Through this illusory panorama, the aspirant has to make his way finding the clue or thread which will lead him out of the maze and holding fast to each tiny fragment of reality as it presents itself to him, learning to distinguish truth from glamour, the pertinent from the impermanent, 
the permanent from the impermanent and the certainty from the unreal. As the old commentary puts it, let the disciple seize hold of the tail of the serpent of wisdom and having with firmness grasped it, let him follow it into the deepest center of the hall of wisdom. Let him, let him follow it into the deepest center of the hall of wisdom. Let him not be betrayed into the trap set for him by the serpent of illusion, but let him shut his eyes to the colorful tracery upon its back and his ears to the melody of its voice. Let him discern the jewel set in the forehead of the serpent whose tail he holds and by its radiance traverse the miry halls of Myra, Maya. He's really teaching us here to, to learn to distinguish and discriminate what we're looking out at, right? Mm -hmm. So important. This is such an important part of the journey here. Um, and that's why they say it takes a long time because you know, you can only be exposed to so many aspects of Maya on a, you know, throughout one day, mm -hmm. you know, even potentially one life. I am what, well, maybe not, maybe not, because as the mind comes into play and you are discriminating, you, you begin that they overlap. I think what one aspect of illusion, then it becomes common sense that this is also illusion over here. So they build on each other until you have the uh, a better picture of what you know what we're looking at in people right. and and experiences and emotions and our what we want out of this. It's just a, it's a, it, it really is an evolutionary process to start this you know this discrimination once the mind comes in at some point. Was it dis dis distinguishing what's, uh, I guess, what's really important too, because it referenced earlier that the astral plane is the, well, the plane of illusion, the plane of glamour. Um, Playground of the gods. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's the distorted and distorted presentation of reality. Um, and, you know, I think it's, saying there that part of it is the attainment of something greater than that which I think serves the self, if that makes sense. Um, meaning that there's truly much more to your life than just pursuing those material goods that you want. Then um, moving up to the top of the chain in your career um you know from a human perspective and from the astral and the physical plane perspective that stuff is very important for a person but we're supposed to be attaining moving to attain something much higher than that um so you need to be able to distinguish that you know that is the illusion that that is what is most important and that is not essentially what is most important. Um, it's that faith in God and moving up and higher to that higher mental plane is where we're trying to get to. Well, actually, we're trying to get much beyond that. But for for most people, it's it's getting to that level so that we as a, I think, collective group can all move on that move in that direction but i'm going to stop there because i think no, it might I, get into it a little no, bit right. no no you're right man uh, but i wanted to clarify that because you know people might be thinking well what do they mean what is the illusion what is and it, that's you know the we're all living in the astral plane because we're we're holding on to these things um that are really holding us down here and not allowing us to move up now i'm not saying people need to give all this stuff up right now but 
eventually well, yeah. you're going to have to find yourself, you know, laying less importance in that and and laying the significance in continuing through the through the path here. Yeah, it's very empty and, you know, and the four, you know, Buddha, uh, you know, in the Four Noble Truths uh, was talking about the astral plane. You know, you know, there's there's desire. You know, your problem is that we desire things. Right. And it's a, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with it, right? There's nothing wrong because you we don't know yet that there's the desire was misplaced yet. Right. You can't know that until you know that until you've experienced uh, what it. You know, that there's nothing at the end of, there's no happiness there. Happiness comes through contentment and serenity and the soul. Right. Um, so you have to first go through this. Exactly. To learn it. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because it is a necessary part of the process. And if That's you just think about it and, di it and dissect it um, in terms that everybody might resonate with is that so we have these desires, we have these goals, we have these things that we want to achieve and we work to achieve them. And then we get there and then what? You keep on trying to go for something more that creates stress, anxiety, um, discontent. You're never happy because you're never, you're always wanting to push higher. I'm not saying you shouldn't push yourself. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that you can't really know what not to desire until you have gone through the process of desiring it and kind of ripping yourself apart, trying to achieve that, whatever it is. Um, and then it kind of brings you back down and settles you once you've kind of gone through that process. And then you're like, okay, well, that's probably not as important as I thought it was, um, time to dig yes. in to what's really yeah. important here it's interesting <laughs> when we talk about it because you know whether you are super successful at every turn or whether you're a super failure at every turn this is where it goes mm -hmm. it only goes in one way right and when he talks about you know the the two paths you have to make a decision you're either going to choose selfish or unselfishness and, and but you know in other books he says you know we are divinity is in us like so so we believe you know we all have something that we believe in god is always there you know that like that so most people at some point are gonna head to the the right way mm -hmm. we're all gonna go oh now there are some who don't, obviously, and, and you know Michael Robbins talks about that pretty good in his on the Moria Federation site, and he he explains some of that. There's not that many, um, and and I want to say that he explains also, and this is kind of interesting for where we're at. That evil really comes from. Uh, a destiny of the individuals who have in the face of the light been repeatedly selfish mm. and having known better and and still and yet deciding to be selfish mm -hmm. and that's that's really few and far between i want to say but yeah, it's, it's, and, and Carla explains the astral plane as the mosh pit, you know, where all these right. forces come together. And it's so easy to, it's so easy to get stuck in it, man, because of our conditioning and mm -hmm. our lives and our family and friends and right. children. Right. And we still have to go there. You know, there's, it's, it's not reality, but it's it's relative to our uh, lives that we're living. Right. 
is uh, it's not what we are. This is it's an experience. I'll say more or less. Our desire for experience or our desire to just it's also emotions. Right. Uh, and our our and it, you know, he, he he explains it here later as it, you know, it's the the rough waters. So let's keep going, I guess. Okay. It's a lot. Uh, no glamour, no illusion can long hold the man who has set himself the task of treading the razor edged path with leads through the wilderness, through the thick set forest, through the deep waters of sorrow and distress, through the valley of sacrifice and over the mountains of vision to the gate of deliverance. That, that's a good way to, to explain it, right? I mean, it's it's hard. That's this is a hard. That's a hard part of the path. He may travel sometimes in the dark, and the illusion of darkness is very real. He may travel sometimes in a light so dazzling and bewildering that he can scarcely see the way ahead. He may know what it what it is to falter on the path and to drop under the fatigue of service and of strife. He may be temporarily sidetracked and wander down the bypaths of ambition, of self-interest, and of material enchantment, but the lapse will be but brief. Nothing in heaven or hell, or on earth or elsewhere, can prevent the progress of the man who has awakened to the illusion, who has glimpsed the reality beyond the glamour of the astral plane, and who has heard, even if once only, the clarion call of his own soul. So it unravels like a sweat, like a wool sweater, right? You pull one, once you pull that, it may stop being pulled, but it's, but it, the pull is already there. It's right. coming out. It's right. going to unravel. There's no stopping it. You, yeah. The astral plane is also the Kurukshetra, Kurukshetra, both of humanity as a whole and of the individual human unit. It is the battleground we're on, must be found. It is the battleground we're on, must be found the Waterloo of every aspirant. In some one life, there comes an emotional crisis in which decisive action is taken and the disciple proves his control of his emotional nature. This may take the form of some great and vital test covering a brief time, but calling forth every resource of wisdom and of purity that the disciple possesses, or it may be a long and protracted emotional strain carried over many years of living. But in the attaining of success and in the achievement of clear vision and right discernment through right discrimination, the disciple testifies to his fitness for the second initiation. You know, I want to say there, man, you know, some of these things, you know, the people that have had hard lives and have lived through very strenuous events, and if they had gone through them with any sort of, you know, intelligence and, and grace and whatnot, you know, you can see this. I don't know that it's always in the forefront that you're saying, I'm going through this. Not everybody's read these books. Right, right. To know what's happening. So there's the prerequisite is not the material. It's it's life. Mm -hmm. that, that is the prerequisite. This is the understanding of it, of what life, what, what of how this kind of works out. I would like to point out that it is this test and crisis through which humanity is now passing and which began in those conditions which culminated in the world war and the present world strain. The first initiation of humanity as an entity took place when individualization became possible and the soul was born in the body of humanity. This was preceded by a period of fearful stress and strain dimly sensed by the pioneers into the human kingdom from the ranks of the animal men. 
Should this crisis be su successfully passed, the second initiation of humanity will be the result, the passing through the baptism and the entering of the stream. So the world war and its resulting effects constitute the Kurukshetra of the world Arjuna, and the outcome is still in the balance. Let this not be forgotten. There is, however, no cause for pessimism. The outcome of good is inevitable. It is, however, a question of a slower, rapid realization and liberation from the great world illusion. And to this end, every aspirant is begged to work strenuously and to lend his aid. Every man who liberates himself, who sees clearly, who releases himself from the glamour of illusion aids in the great work. So again, as above, so below, the law of correspondences comes into play as just in the man and in, in the individual man, so as in humanity. So if we look at the current world events from the much zoomed out, you know, a bigger picture, we can kind of start to see where we as humanity are in the process. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's a deep contemplation that, we, you know, that but is something to definitely look at. Um, well, I think it referenced it earlier in the chapter or the rule about, I don't remember the exact wording and I don't want to go back right now, but maybe we can at the end, but um, something to the effect of the emotional state of the man kind of, um, you know, this whole astral plane is where there's that kind of synergy between the emotional reaction of the individual man versus the entire group versus the entire world. And when you just said, looking at the state of what's going on in the world, it's a lot of crisis. There's a lot of strain, a lot of uncertainty, a lot a of lot fear. A lot of quote unquote evil. Right. But my point is, is that it's a major emotional reaction that the entire population of the world is having, but that trickles into each individual. And I think there's that synergy there. You know, we're getting lost in this illusion, but we're letting ourselves get lost in this illusion that we kind of got to break free from, if that makes yeah, any man, sense at it, all. In yeah. a way, yeah, you're right. I mean, but and in a way, it seems like the illusion is the crisis. Oh, absolutely. We're creating. Absolutely. We're both we're creating. creating. We're both creating and working through it and evolving through it as a whole, you know, together. And the more that can see through it, and intelligently work our way through these crises, the better the our opportunity is. Well, and there's probably some truth in the thought behind that too, that um, because it references in here too, that you know, eventually you're gonna hit that breaking point where you're gonna start seeing through that veil of illusion and essentially waking up to the truth. Um and so you see that happening in people, and this is all a necessary part of that kind of waking up process is 100% going, necessary. going through that emotional discontent and state that everybody seems to be going through. Well, that's a good sign that you're starting to wake up. <laughs> well, and when you say everybody, it's good, you know, because we're, this is happening as a whole. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Humanity. Um, Humanity is disillusioned and they're starting to wake up from it. And that's this whole, a lot of a, this emotional reaction is. You no, know, because for a while we didn't know we were technically very few understood that we were doing this to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But as we go more and more realize it and we can intelligently with, you know, the use of the mind, you know, the mental plane, start helping ourselves out of the out of our distress and, and, you know, working through it. It's very, it, it does bring uh, the big picture kind of together there. 
you know. All right. Absolutely. Do you want to do you want to pick up there? Yeah, where where was it again, that we left off? Uh, again, the astral plane is that we're on. Oh, okay. So again, the astral plane is that where on the pairs of opposites act and interact, and where on the pull of the great dualities is most potently felt. Primarily, the interaction is between the soul and its vehicle matter. <clears throat> between the soul and its vehicle matter, but there are many lesser dualities which play their part and are more easily recognized by the average man. Light and darkness interact, as do pleasure and pain, Good and evil meet and form the playground of the gods, and poverty and riches are offset one against the other. The entire modern economic situation is of an astral nature. It is the outcome of desire and the result of a certain selfish use of the forces of matter. Heat and cold, as we understand the term, in a most peculiar manner are the result of the interplay of the pairs of opposites and an interesting line of occult study concerns itself with the effects of racial emotions on climactic conditions. We, mo we most truly make our climate in one significant sense. When desire has burnt itself out, planetary life comes to an end, as climactic conditions will negate form life as we understand it. In relation to the human unit, the secret of liberation lies in the balancing of the forces and the equilibrizing of the pairs of opposites. The path is the narrow line between these pairs, which the aspirant finds and treads, turning neither to the right nor to the left. It must be remembered always that when the pairs of opposites are discerned, when a man balances the forces of his own nature, when he has found the path and become the path, then he can work with the world forces can preserve the balance and the equilibrium of the energies of the three worlds, and so become a co-worker with the masters of the wisdom. Let us pray and hope that this may be the practical outcome of our understanding of the nature of the battleground of the astral plane. So some references there to what we were just talking about, going back to the discussion um, specifically. Yeah, we have to balance. Sorry, we have to balance this. Right. Well, where it just said that uh, the modern economic situation is of an astral nature, outcome of desire, the result of certain selfish use of the forces of matter. Um, you know, so there's a lot of the tension and the problems that we have in the world created out of these personal selfish desires. Um, yeah, the, the, and the kind of professing that that's what you should be doing with your life is working to attain these personal and selfish desires moving up that ladder um now it's not to say you can't do that and also serve selflessly in this nature um but you need to be able to understand that those desires are really important yeah and, and on top of that you know the occult use of money is something that is is discussed in in many in any occult group mm -hmm. you know and and that has its that has its roots in tithing you know i want to say tithing in the church you, mm -hmm. know, you know giving money towards the churches and whatnot you know but ultimately and, and DK does mention this, you know, money is useful. It's, it can be used two ways. Right. We, we can either be using this money to create positive change. Right. Or by those who know the, the value and use of it, or we can use it for selfish, you know, to selfish ends. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, the, the economic aspect of it is we, we need more people who are awakened to the illusion and can see through the illusion to start getting together and bring in change about in the economy. We need our leaders to be awakened. Right. Beings who understand this. Right. And so, you know, they're, they would certainly have a difficult time in, uh, in bringing that about with a, with a world that is still very selfish, 
So who are we to judge? You know, because not all world leaders. I I don't I don't want to say all world leaders are are bad. You know, so we can't judge their path because and DK says world leaders are necessarily um, suffering saviors, mm -hmm. and how they go about bringing change is as as advanced people. And, and how they're portrayed to the public. That's not our business. We, we're, we have to focus on ourselves before we can um, start judging others. So it's, you know, judging others there is a, it's an important thing to you. Well, do we ever really get to a point where we should be judging others anyway? I don't know that we should or do. Not judging, it's not, but right. you can, you can see, you know, we can see, you know, they're, they're, their nature because we are at some gotcha. point we start to gotcha. understand we just in we in through intuition and and what we're talking about and and as the functioning comes into play mm -hmm. uh, i i think you can you start to understand the nature of of this thing right so you can start to understand the nature of others and even if it's just in a large by a larger picture right but with the when you start to know this and and, and the other things that dk is talking about i don't want to say you judge you don't judge others but you can what's the word assess and kind of learn where to help and and the, right where to give you know your your attention and where not Gotcha. That's just intelligent. I think that's probably an intelligent use of our, you know, abilities at a certain point, which takes learning and growth, mm -hmm. all that. And that's what we're learning to do. So Maybe look yeah. at it in terms of what can we do to kind of offset what we perceive as kind of heading in the wrong direction, so to speak. I think we want to definitely be gentle oh, definitely. With, with everyone that, you know, and then, but you don't want to be too gentle because change has to happen. Right. So there's that balancing there and, the, and the wise use of, you know, the energy or, or forces on the astral plane, you know, because so the astral plane is forces. Right. It's not necessarily energies. I mean, I don't know how you want to differentiate that, but the wise use of them brings about positive change. Mm -hmm. And then, and but on the astral plane also, we're learning the use of them. Right. So there's gonna, it's gonna go both ways. Right. Because we're gonna make mistakes. You, you know, every disciple an aspirant or anybody in the waking you know anybody as we're evolving we're making mistakes it's just a matter of uh, learning mm -hmm. very cool mm -hmm. all right the two paths Passing from our consideration of the nature of the astral plane, we will deal with its functions and the relation of the disciple to its activities. Let us remember certain things about it. First, it is preeminently the battleground, and on it, it is fought, and on it is fought the warfare which eventuates in the final release of the imprisoned soul. It is useful to have in mind the outstanding characteristics of the three planes and the three bodies which, fu which function on them. The physical plane is the plane of active experience in and through matter. It is the plane of externalization, and according to the condition and point of development of the inner man, so will be the outer form and its activities. The astral plane is the plane whereon the man passes through three stages of consciousness. First, he gains, through his sensory apparatus, consciousness in the world of forms and develops ability to react to those forms with wisdom and intelligence. 
this consciousness he shares with the animal world, though he goes far beyond them in some respects, owing to his possession of a correlating and coordinating mind. Second, sensitivity, or awareness of moods, emotions and feelings, desires and aspirations which have their roots within him in the principle of self-consciousness or in the ahamkara principle, as the occultist who loves difficult phrases is apt to call it. And yes, many difficult phrases in the occultist terminology. Um, this he shares in common with his fellow man. Third is spiritual awareness or sensitiveness to the spiritual world and the feeling aspect of the higher consciousness. This has its roots in the soul, presupposes the dominance of the mental nature, and is that faculty which constitutes him a mystic. This awareness he shares in common with all disciples and is the reward of the gained victories of his astral plane experience. The mental plane comes next. In it, the right use of the intellect is the outstanding achievement. This is also characterized by three stages. The first stage, wherein the mind is the receiver of impressions from the outer world via the five senses and the brain. This is a negative condition, and in it, the modifications of the thinking principle are brought about through the impacts of the external world and the reactions of the astral world. The second stage, wherein the mind initiates its own activities, and wherein the intellect is a dominating factor. Though thrown into activity by the factors enumerated above, it is responsive also to the thought currents of the mental plane as well, and becomes exceedingly active as a result of these two contacts. Out of these, a third activity supervenes wherein the reasoning principle acts upon the information gained in these two ways, sets its own streams of thoughts, and formulates its own thought forms as well as registering those of others. The third stage wherein the soul through concentration and meditation succeeds in imposing its, its ideas and impressions upon the mind held steady in the light and so enables the mental body to respond to impressions and contacts emanating from the subjective and spiritual worlds. Yet, the battle par excellence is fought out in the astral body and only reaches its most intense point and its potent fierceness where there is a good physical instrument and a well-equipped mentality. The greater the sensitivity of the astral body, the greater its reactions to the physical world and to the mental condition, and hence the fact emerges that disciples and the more highly evolved people in the world have a more potent astral body and work under greater emotional strain than the less highly evolved and the liberated sons of God. Students are therefore begged to deal drastically and potently with their emotional natures, remembering that victory descends from above and cannot be worked up to from below. Soul must govern, and its instrument in the warfare is the cons consecrated mind. It is interesting to note the occult sequence and the description given of this plane in the rule under consideration. It is first. It is first of all the plane of dual forces. The first thing the aspirant becomes aware of is duality. The little evolved man is aware of synthesis, but it is the synthesis of his material nature. The highly spiritual man is aware also of synthesis, but it is that of his soul whose consciousness is that of unity. But in between is the wretched aspirant, conscious of duality above all else and pulled hither and thither between the two. His first step has, for its objective, to make him aware of the pairs of opposites and of necessity to choose between them. Through the light, which he has discovered in himself, he becomes aware of the dark. Through the good which attracts him, he sees the evil which is for him, the line of least resistance. Through the activity of pain, he can visualize and become aware of pleasure, and heaven and hell become to him realities. Through the, through the activity of the attractive life of his soul, he realizes the attraction of matter and of form, 
and is forced to recognize the urge and pull of both of them. He learns to feel himself as pendant twixt the two great forces. And once the dualities are grasped, it dawns on him slowly and surely that the deciding factor in the struggle is his divine will in contradistinction to his selfish will. Thus, the dual forces play their part until they are seen as two great streams of divine energy pulling in opposite directions, and he becomes then aware of the two paths mentioned in our rule. One path leads back into the dreary land of rebirth, and the other leads through the golden gate to the city of free souls. One is therefore involutionary and involves him in deepest matter. The other leads him out of the body nature and makes him eventually aware of his spiritual body through which he can function in the kingdom of the soul. One path later on, when he is a true and pledged chela, is known to him as the left-hand path and the other path of right activity. On one path, he becomes proficient in black magic which is only the developed powers of the personality subordinated to the selfish purposes of a man whose motives are those of self-interest and worldly ambition. These confine him to the three worlds and shut the door which opens on to life. On the other path, he subordinates his personality and exercises the magic of the white brotherhood, working always in the light of the soul with the soul in all forms and laying no emphasis upon the ambitions of the personal self. Clear discrimination of these two paths reveals what is called in some occult books that narrow razor edged path, which lies between the two. This is the noble middle path of the Buddha and remarks the fine line of demarcation between the pairs of opposites and between the two streams which he has learned to recognize, one going up unto the gates of heaven, and the other passing down into the nethermost hell. By the exercise of the two main weapons of the aspirant, discrimination and dispassion, he gains that quality which is called in this rule the vital power. Just as the eye is the instrument of choice in choosing the way of travel on the physical plane and has besides a potency all its own whereby it attracts and develops its own sign language, so a vital power is felt in the aspirant. This eventually brings the third eye into activity, and so there is gained a potency and a clear vision which make, a, which make right choice and quick progress upon the way of steady progression. We are told that power is grown or developed in silence, and only he who can find a center of peace within his head, where the paths of the bodily forces and the spiritual inflowing tides meet, can rightly practice true discrimination and that dispassion which bring the controlled astral and mental bodies under the guidance of the soul. Then he can understand the significance of the vibrating poles and achieve that point of equilibrium which is the result of their interaction and vibration. The sensing of the dual forces and the clear discrimination of the two paths leads to the development of the vital power. This vital power demonstrates its first activity in enabling the aspirant to achieve a point of balance and so stand on that pinnacle of achievement whereon a choice is made. What is that choice? For the aspirant, it is that between rapid and slow progress. For the disciple, accepted and loyal, it is the choice between methods of service. For the initiate, it off lies betwixt spiritual advancement and the arduous work of staying with the group and working out the plan. For the master, it is the choice between the seven paths, and it will therefore be apparent how much more strenuous and difficult is his problem. All, however, prepares the aspirant for right choice through the right, through right discrimination leading to right action and made possible through practice dispassion. In the set, in this sentence is summed up the technique of the warrior upon the battlefield of the desire plane or the astral plane. It should here be noted that in the steadily developing power of choice and the loyally fought battle of the astral plane, the consciousness is the man in the man shifts stage by stage 
First, it is the battered earth-weary aspirant who has to struggle with desire, with glamour, with ambition, and with his sensitive emotional body. He thinks the battle is stupendous, but from the wider angle, it is relatively small, yet all that he can stand. Later, it is the experienced probationary disciple who wrestles in the veil of illusion and deals not alone with his own nature, but with the forces of that veil also, recognizing its dual nature. Then the disciple comes forth to battle and faces with courage, and often with clear vision, the forces arrayed against him. They involve not only those in his own nature and in those aspects of the astral plane to which he naturally reacts, but also involve the forces of illusion arrayed against the group of disciples to which he belongs. Let all disciples take note of this and have it in mind in these difficult and strenuous days. Such disciples are in conscious contact at times with their soul forces, and for them there is no defeat nor turning back. They are the tried warriors, scarred and tired, yet knowing that triumphant victory lies ahead, for the soul is omnipotent. Except the disciples who battle all the accepted disciples who battle all the above enumerated factors, plus the black forces arrayed against the elder brothers, can call upon the spiritual energies of their group, and at rare and indicated moments upon the master under whom they work. Thus, the work and labors expands. Thus, the responsibility and struggle steadily increases. Yet at the same time, there is also a steadily growing reception of potencies which can be contacted and utilized, and which, when correctly contacted, ensure victory at the end. The phrase, the one who meditates, relates to the soul. Arjuna, the aspiring disciple, resigns the struggle and hands the weapons and the reins of government to Krishna, the soul, and is rewarded at last by understanding and by a vision of the divine form which veils the Son of God who is himself. When this battle has been fought and won, the disciple steps into the ranks of the white magicians of our planet and can wield forces, cooperate with the plan, command the elementals, and bring order out of chaos. He is no longer immersed in the world of illusion, but has risen above it. He can no longer be held down by the chains of his own past habits and his karma. He has gained the vital power and stands forth an elder brother. Such is the path ahead of each and all who dare to tread it. Such is the opportunity offered to all students who have made their choice with dispassion and are promoted by love and the desire to serve. And that is rule seven. Man. You know, that the battle between, uh, you know, the battle of Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita is, it, it always comes up, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's such a great example. But, but in that, right, the resigning the struggle and hands the weapon and reins of government to Krishna, that that being the where you can you release from the from this from the astral plane right uh, or now that's that's not easy to do no to commit and, and stop worrying and stressing about our daily lives and trust right. and trust that it's it's taken care of and and you're doing it's gonna happen you're gonna do it right you don't have to stress on it there doesn't have to be the emotional you know, display when it's not necessary. You don't have to desire anything. It's going to happen. It's right. taken care of. It's been said over and over. You know, give, you know, what, there's a country song that called uh, Jesus Take the Wheel. Mm. Well, do you really mean that? 
you know, I, and, and, and that for your whole life, not just in this circumstance or that circumstance, but the whole circumstance of everything here. And then being willing, and that's the choice, and, and you know, being willing to, you know, become an agent of that, mm -hmm. of, of whatever comes, take it as it comes without any um, attachment, you know, to it necessarily. It doesn't mean, you know, I think people get confused because, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't show different levels of emotion. You right. show them intelligently now. Right, it's, right, right. It's not being tossed to and fro. Yeah. You're assessing the situations as they come and displaying the proper amount of. You know, right. Yeah. I don't think it's saying that you have to you have to become and look like this dull dead being that's just kind of waltzing through like, life yeah like completely stoic you know <laughs> it's like, like marcus aurelius is saying like just be stoic and you just yeah. no that's not how this goes right right it doesn't mean you don't sometimes yell at your children because they still need to see and to not do things that are bad for their health and protectant of them. So you're still going to yell, hey. Right. <laughs> that, that is intelligent use of that emotion. I was going to say, time. we just have to yell at them intelligently. <laughs> and then you go back to loving, you know, right? Right. You know, you're, you're, but that's a part of it, right? It's, 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 it's that tough love aspect because they need that, you know, we need that too. Um, yeah, it's dangerous. It's more dangerous to be stoic in a situation that requires the use of a display of emotion. Right. Well, because as we, I think we talked about earlier, you, you, you have to work through all that process individually to be able to overcome it, because you can't really overcome something you don't know. Um, and so... Yeah, you can't really hide the emotion, but you have to project it in an intelligent way. A lot of people, I want to say, stand behind. <clears throat> you know, they 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 just say, "Well, this is me, and this is how I am," and and then they want to keep <coughs> that that going. Mm -hmm. So they they they're who they are. You know, they they assign to their desire and emotional you know um being or whatever or, or their looks mm -hmm. and that's not who we are no well that would be uh treading a little bit too far onto the path of the left the left hand path is that what it was yeah. so when you made the comment earlier about our leaders political leaders need to be awakened they need to be awakened to the the path of right activity versus the path, the left-hand path. Okay, but here's the thing. You, you, we, I totally agree, but I should restate that, you know, we are the ones supposed to be choosing them, right? Well, That's what this whole thing is about. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. until we get to an intelligent place, we're going to keep... Putting the wrong people in office, right? Yeah, it's our Fault. it's all out all of this is our out. Thing. and that's right. that's the other thing too is people need to really look at themselves with the issues and the problems that are affecting them emotionally in this world um nobody's really doing that to you you're kind of doing it to yourself everybody's in everybody's through their actions has gotten us to where we are um and so you need to process that as well is that you gotta you gotta look within um i don't want to say too much because i'm going to lose my training at thought and then it's probably just going to come out silly but i think you know where i'm going with that it's it's sure. you, you, you've there's really nothing that you can't blame yourself for it's just non-existent i i didn't always think this way um but a lot of my kind of turning in that method of thinking has has kind of been clarified as I've been reading through these materials and these these texts that are out there because it helps you kind of grip and understand 
the psychology of what's happening. Um, and you really do start to look in that mirror, you know, when you're when something's just not doesn't seem to be going your way. Well, why is it not going my way? It's that there's something pre that I did. Uh, but that's that's with everything. Well, it's, it's on sir, us to elect the right people. Does it it's feel a, good? It's, it's on us. A, yeah, it's, it's on us to decide not to um, hate somebody else because of a religion they might practice and have to go to war over it or whatever. It's just that's there's nothing driving that to occur other than the emotional perception that we're kind of taking from it and how we're reacting to that because i see a lot of anger out there in people and well, they desire something you know right but the desire ooh. is misplaced in the wrong direction that's all. yeah anyway you were getting ready to say something well, I, mean, that, I mean that's no that's right on there it's right between the right and left path their desire is literally facing the wrong way right and then you know in order to see through the illusion you you just you have to kind of you have to drop that right you have to choose the right way and and really being it's it's it's, it's it's the desire to move, you know, forward in right. evolution. But it's so, it beca- you know, there's so many smart people, and 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 we're, you know, we do, we're much more advanced than we're giving ourselves credit for. Mm. Like this vehicle and our consciousness is so much further along than we're, you know, allowing. Um, we can control ourselves in such a, a more deeper way than what we're displaying, expressing, and showing everyone. Uh, we have the power in all of us to overcome this. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. You know, right. Like that. So uh, it's that to desire to overcome that. Because it does not feel good to have anxiety. It doesn't feel good to to be angry and yell at people. And surely your soul, the soul, you know, is is it doesn't it makes you feel worse. Mm-hmm. So then the only, you know, and this is the four noble truths, you know, and uh, the only way out, and as Arjuna kind of saw is. The hand over the reins, you know, and then you do that through the, you know, through a pra- you know, I want to say pra- through experience, right? And, you know, the, the Buddhists have the, you know, the eight, yeah, eight, eight, and all that, and uh, you know, there's different ways. But... Yeah, to kind of just let that go and have faith. Raja, plant- Raja Yoga, yeah, like, right. Uh, you know have faith that the plan is going to work out the way it needs to work out. And that doesn't mean you throw caution to the wind per se, but, but yeah, I know what you mean. So some of the, you know, what are the desires on the, on the astral plane? And we just kind of went through all this, but what, what are we looking at now in today's world, you know, a bigger house, uh, more pay, a nicer car, hmm. Keeping up with the Joneses kind of things. Well, there's a lot of that going on. And there's a lot of this manifestation of your best life stuff that's kind we of we all want something different life. too. Right. Right. Like like they say, we all want, you know, power, money, or experiences. Um we're all kind, you know, and you know, different things, but what are the what, what are the experiences we're looking at? We are jo- happiness. We want to go to. We just we want to watch football. We want to play football. We want to be a part of something. These are all abstracted things. You you do want to be a part of something. You do want to participate in something. You do want, but we but we're looking at at it the wrong. There's a the wrong things mm-hmm. it's all like a reflection i think 
And it's not to say that people who do those things can't enjoy them. No, it's we don't know yet. No, it's the it's the perception of it's really hard to frame. I saw this on something I watched the other night, and I can't remember. It might have been one of the Samadhi um, episodes. Might have been, but it, you have to realize that it's not the important end all be all thing. Um, yeah, you can't tell anybody either. It right. has to be learned. Right, exactly. Um, but I wanted to throw that out there because I, you know, it's not like, you know, it's like we're saying you, you, uh, you have faith in the in the process in the plan that it's going to work out, and you kind of hand over the the weapons and the reins of government to Krishna. But it doesn't mean you have to throw caution to the wind. Um, and you know the active pursuit for you know i want to be a better football player or i want to be a better guitar player you know because i play guitar but i enjoy it but i know it's not um it's not what defines me right it's not it's it's just something i do but it's not what i find most important if that makes any sense yeah i think dk says in one of the in one of the books he says the choice doesn't become it's not the choice between good and evil at some point that's no longer the choice that you're making mm -hmm. it's between good and better pretty much carla told us that once and what might have yeah. been referenced in one of the earlier episodes um where she said yeah it's not a matter of choosing between good and evil it's good and gooder right, right, right. <laughs> so it's and then there's an intelligent use of time and the intelligent use of energy that you're expending on those things and you know proportion out there it's a, yeah and that that's probably i think that's what i was trying to get at is you can't let these things consume you I say, because all it's going to do is yeah, become you attached to it. Right. Anything. That's yeah. it. You, you've got to let yourself go from the attachment. And that is exactly what I heard on the Samadhi episode three. I think I listened to the other night was it's not about telling yourself you can't do these things. You have to be able to willing to let go of the attachment with those things. Like right. you're in a job and you make good money. OK, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you're good at what you do. So you do it and you you're able to provide well for your family. Great. But you have to be able to attach yourself from that is it, you know, because yeah, that's that, who you are. The pursuit of that isn't it. That's just a part of who you are in this physical body while you're here in this incarnation. But the yeah, important but, it is, I think, uh, higher than that. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I... No, DK says something to the effect of how many lives have you toiled in the physical body? You know, how many. You know, haven't you done the things, you know, that these things, you know, mm -hmm. you do not, you know, we want what we want is you, you don't need to keep doing them over and over again. You know, you've had that experience. It, it is non-essential at that point. It might have been essential at some point in time that you were doing it, but it's no longer once you get to this unraveling the illusion. That's no longer an essential part of this. Mm -hmm. And then there's this point, I think, when the illusion, when you are kind of start to be introduced to some of the material that we're talking about here, you realize that there's literally an entirely new world out there that you have, we have no idea whatsoever about. And that eventually we have to learn to function properly in it in order to escape, truly escape from prison, the, you know, of the body. Um, we have to, and you have to do it on your own and nobody can help you. You know, you get a lot of help along the way for certain, for certain. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's always some level of help, I think. 
Um, but there is the work that, that has to be done individually too. And then, you know, it's just the immensity of the amount of knowledge that we have not been exposed to until this point that confronted me. And, I, and then I'm going, OMG, I know nothing that I'm supposed to know. I, I know nothing as yet I'm supposed to know it. And I think that's biblical. And, and then and that also goes back to another biblical quote that really kicked me in the butt a long time ago was, um, the, knowledge, the knowledge of this world is foolishness with God. Uh, the, wis the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So the things that we consider ourselves wise about are not, it's, it's good to know that you can become wise about something. That's not what we're supposed to ultimately become wise of, though. That was a stepping stone to, um, to start to have the ability to become wise with using this body and time properly. Hmm. And, you know, towards the, you know, at the end of it and using it for the, the betterment of humanity and and learning right human relations and the proper use of love and, and compassion and emotions and our intellect it's just the proper use of all these things right right actions you know making the right choices and you know another thing dk does say which i which i think is important is we we focus way too much on the physical body mm -hmm. and the physical. We're not looking deeper into what are our emotions and our thoughts and, and contemplating them more. We're, we get stuck focusing on, I need to do this to be a better person. I need to eat healthier. I'm, I have this bad habit or I want, you know, all those things. That's a, another distraction. You know, yes, you can, you know, you can control it to see. So, so you prove it to yourself that you can for a minute and then move on to, to analyzing the depths of why, you know, it's a lot of contemplation work mm -hmm. from in the mind. I mean, we do need to take care of the physical body, though. It even says it right here. Of course, it, it's a prerequisite. Um, but it goes back to my point that I made about letting it consume you. Um, because you have to take care of the body. It is the temple that houses the soul. Um, but you got to take care of that too, right? So I think it's a matter of, yeah, take care of yourself, but don't let that consume yeah, you. But that doesn't thing. mean you need to become a vegetarian right now and maintain that right. for all of eternity. Right. You need to know that you can control it. Right. And then you need to know that you can control your desires and emotions. Right. And then you need to know that you can control your mental capacities and your thoughts and, and, and how you're building. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we prove at each level that we can do those things. And then before there's a real setting being set free, you have to be able to prove all three of those things at the same time mm. in conjunction with one another. Right. And that's when you are really free from this lower three experience. So that's, and that's not an easy task, you know, and that's why we're here. And that's just, it's about getting comfortable in that, to, you know, and, and this is such good news, mm -hmm. you know, it's so beautiful and it's such good news to have this and to have them have told us the ways, you know, and what this is about. And it's, and it's totally understandable that people work. That's a, that's correct. You know, use of time. Mm -hmm. It's not that we are not supposed to um, give up our lives and go live in a cave. Right. Symbolically that stands true and but that's not the not an actual cave not a physical cave 
You know, <laughs> that, uh, that's why we get yeah. quiet when we meditate. <laughs> that's when we go uh, to the cave. <laughs> mm. You know that, and I, you know, you know that, you know, there's organizations that teach to proper use of time. That's what the, that's what the gauge is for. And the, 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 is it the 24 inch ruler of masonry is to divide up your day properly with the 24 hours and to continue to progress. You know, it's when we, it's when, you know, we're just not, we're just stuck, you know, in our own thoughts, in our own experiences in the past or projecting out into the future that we get really sidetracked. Mm -hmm. Or desire and desire, which is all there on the in the astral plane, which is what we're talking about. And 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 rule eight does continue on with the uh, with the astral plane and the types of forces that we encounter in them, which is really awesome to know. So we're building on this, and we can understand ourselves much more deeply. Um, through all this but yeah we're gonna call it there for the week yeah good discussion yeah and then we'll hit rule eight and continue on with understanding of the astral sounds good and, yeah all right buddy i'm going to shut the video off now all righty see you next week <laughs>